Watching over Portsmouth Harbour from high upon Portsdown Hill rests a mighty fortress. Built in the 19th century to repel a feared French invasion that would never come, it remained in service well into the 20th century and served during the First and Second World Wars. Today the fort is a museum and houses the extensive artillery collection of the Royal Armouries. This is Fort Nelson. Fort Nelson is what is known as a Palmerston Fort. The Palmerston Forts were a string of defensive structures built throughout Britain during the latter half of the 19th century, due to concerns over the expansion and modernisation of the French military and navy. In the year 1853, France and Britain had entered into an uneasy alliance against Russia during the Crimean War. However, after the war ended in 1856, relations between the nations deteriorated. That same year, the leader of France, Napoleon III, decided to strengthen and reinforce the French port of Cherbourg. This port lay just across the channel from Portsmouth, Britain's premier naval base and home to its largest military asset, the Royal Navy. The strengthening of Cherbourg helped cause fears of a possible French invasion to peak. The Prime Minister of the time, Lord Palmerston, described Cherbourg as a dagger pointed directly at the heart of this country. As a result, he helped to organise the 1860 Royal Commission on the Defence of the United Kingdom, which proposed the construction of new fortifications at strategically important sites throughout the country. In the event of war, the defence of Portsmouth was obviously crucial. Unfortunately, its current defences were considered outdated and inadequate. Various new defences were planned, including five large fortresses to be built upon the strategically significant location of Portsdown Hill. This hill overlooks Portsmouth Harbour, and it was considered vital that this location did not fall into the hands of invading French forces, since it was the perfect location from which artillery could bombard the naval base into submission. The British knew such a plan could succeed, since a similar strategy had been employed against the port of Sebastopol during the Crimean War, ultimately leading to its fall. Fort Nelson was designed by the Royal Engineers, with the overall design being drawn up by William Crossman, a Royal Engineer under the Inspector General of Fortifications. A polygonal fortress was planned, with practically every angle of approach covered by multiple guns and loopholes, designed to catch invading troops in the crossfire. The fort was named after the revered Admiral Horatio Nelson, who led the British fleet at the Battle of Trafalgar, where the combined navies of France and Spain were defeated. Nelson was killed during the battle when he was shot on the deck of his flagship, HMS Victory. This ship is still docked in Portsmouth at the historic dockyard and is the world's oldest naval ship still in commission. A memorial to Nelson stands a short distance from the fort and was erected in 1808, several decades before the fort and even Nelson's column in London were built. Fort Nelson was just one of five forts planned to be built on Portsdown Hill. Construction of the forts was not supported by the public at the time, who derided the loss of what was considered recreational grounds. The annual fair held on Portsdown Hill was cancelled, and farmers who lost crops had to apply to local authorities for compensation. Despite the public outcry, purchasing of the necessary lands was accomplished quickly, and construction of Fort Nelson would begin in May of 1861. The contract to build Fort Nelson as well as two of the other forts was won by a civilian contractor named William Treadwell, who had previous experience constructing large railway projects. Treadwell had also quoted the lowest price of £54,236 to complete the first stage of construction. Construction of the fort was divided into two phases, the first being the creation of the earthworks, digging ditches and erecting ramparts, and the second was the actual building of the fortress itself. The government desired the first phase to be completed urgently, in a matter of two to three months. This was so that in the event of a rapid invasion, guns could be placed upon the earthworks to act as a makeshift emergency defence. The actual building of the fort would take over ten years. With his knowledge of railways, Treadwell constructed several lines both above and below ground to link the three forts he was building with the nearby town of Fareham, so that supplies could be easily shipped in. Interestingly, the location of some of the subterranean tunnels that were dug remains a mystery to this day. Most of the first phase of construction was carried out by hundreds of navvies. These were Victorian workmen, well known for their prowess with picks and shovels, and for having constructed Britain's massive array of canals, railways, reservoirs and sewers. 
It's thought a single navvy was able to move as much as 20 tonnes of soil per day, and it's also said he could drink as much beer as well. The navvies lived in wooden huts close by, and a canteen and beer house were erected to provide the workers with food and drink. Construction of Fort Nelson was completed in 1871, the same year that France would suffer a humiliating defeat during the Franco-Prussian War, causing the perceived threat of a French invasion to all but diminish. This unfortunately rendered the purpose of the Palmerston Forts redundant, and in time these expensive structures would often be referred to as Palmerston's Follies. Another recommendation of the 1860 Royal Commission was the expansion of Britain's army, with one idea to bolster its numbers being by raising volunteers. Surprisingly, despite no pay being offered, this idea proved to be greatly popular. Perhaps driven by feelings of patriotic duty, a great number of men signed up to serve. In the words of General Sir William Gervois, The glorious volunteer movement was an evidence of the belief that it would be wrong to trust naval means alone for the defence of the coast. Many of these volunteers from Portsmouth and the surrounding areas would be put to work manning the new forts. The first soldiers to occupy Fort Nelson would march through its gates in September of 1871. They were two companies of the 1st Battalion of the 4th Regiment of Foot, which was composed of seven regular army officers, 171 volunteers, two horses, 17 wives and 24 children. Accommodation for these men and their families comprised nine barracks rooms. Luckily for them, these new barracks were airy and uncramped. This was largely thanks to the campaigns of the nurse Florence Nightingale, who after witnessing the appalling unsanitary conditions that soldiers had to endure during the Crimean War, called for radical improvements to military health care. Lord Palmerston was an ally of Nightingale, and as a result, Fort Nelson was built with a ten-bed hospital, medical stores and a dispensary. This is a recreation of one of the original barracks built for the Victorian soldiers. The beds would have folded up during the day to save space. Outside the barracks is a street which gave the soldiers access to an ablutions room, where there were cold water basins for washing and lavatories which were located in an uncovered room, an unappealing prospect for any desperate soldier during the winter. During this period this street would have been crowded with horses drawing carts for ammunition and men heading out to parade, or into the gloom of one of the three underground tunnels that connected to the fort's outermost defences. A soldier's day began at 6.30 in the morning with a cold water wash before returning to make up beds and prepare kit for inspection. Their meals were basic and were prepared in the cookhouse and consumed in the barracks. The non-commissioned officers meanwhile ate in a mess on the first floor of the barracks. In stark contrast, the commissioned officers lived a much more comfortable existence, often owing to their higher class in society. They possess relatively luxurious quarters on the first floor, as well as a dining room and drawing room overlooking the Solent. They even had quarters for their servants. This is a recreation of the officer's mess kitchen. During the 1880s, the British Army performed training drills at the fort, where soldiers would practice defending against simulated assaults, and in 1886 the fort would finally receive its armament. It was originally armed with 32-pounder smoothbore breech-loading cannon, most of which were positioned in the fort's three cabineers. These were defensive structures that stuck out from the main structure of the fort. This is the North Capineer, which was designed to mount eight guns. There were two other demi capineers that would have each mounted four guns. A dry ditch surrounds the fort, and any enemy infantry attempting to cross would have come under fire from the capineers' cannons. They were often loaded with case shot, which was a thin iron tube filled with lead balls. The case would split apart after firing, creating a cloud of lead projectiles designed to shred enemy infantry, making these cannons essentially giant shotguns. Each gun port has two loopholes either side, so that men with rifles could defend the guns. There were also firing galleries, where defending troops could lay down rifle fire. Most of the fort's guns were directed at facing an enemy advancing from the north. However, some cannons could also be found inside buildings covering the entrances and barracks in the event that an enemy might try to advance between two of the forts. Other armaments of this period included 13-inch mortars, produced by the Barking Foundry. There were three mortar batteries, each containing three mortars. This is the North Battery. These mortars would have bombarded the enemy with explosive bombs or shells, and had a range of about 3,000 yards. 
attached to the North Battery as a viewing area and firing steps to help defend it from invading troops. An example of one of the 32-pounders and 13-inch mortar are still kept in firing condition and are regularly fired during demonstrations by the fort's volunteers. Gunpowder for the guns was stored in barrels in two large vaulted underground magazines. Men would inspect the barrels daily for dampness and cartridges would be made on site as required, a very unpopular job for obvious reasons. Before the invention of electric lighting, illuminating a magazine like this could be extremely dangerous. As such, this magazine possesses a lighting passage. As the name suggests, this was a passage that ran alongside the magazine, where lanterns would be placed. Windows made of thick glass faced into the magazine and allowed it to be lit whilst greatly reducing the risk of ignition. Men entered the magazine via the shifting lobby, where they had to change into special magazine overalls and soft slippers. There were strict rules for soldiers working in the magazine, no metal was allowed to be brought inside and the uniform would be inspected before being allowed to enter. Eventually the job of making cartridges was abandoned and only cartridges made in special government factories which were of a higher quality and more reliable were used. These were stored in one magazine and shells in the other. One issue of the fort design that was not foreseen during construction was the fact that the magazine lies on the main passageway between the street and northern batteries. Soldiers frequented this passage and it would have been impractical for them to change out of their hobnailed boots every time they passed through. Because of this a bypass tunnel was built allowing the soldiers to safely go around the magazine. Far more impressive than the 13 inch mortars found inside, standing on display in front of the fort is Mallet's mortar, the largest bore artillery ever built. It was conceived of in 1854 by an Irish civil engineer called Robert Mallet, who wanted to create a weapon that could devastate enemy fortifications and be powerful enough to destroy any arch vault. He concluded that a 36 inch shell containing about 480 pounds of black powder would be capable of penetrating 15 feet into the ground and, after exploding, create a crater 40 feet wide. This would generate a shockwave similar to an earthquake and would make the weapon capable of devastating any fortification in existence at the time. This mortar is 1600 times more powerful than the 13 inch mortar stationed in Fort Nelson. Its construction posed a dilemma however, as a single piece could not withstand the force of firing projectile up to one and a half miles. To overcome this, Mallet devised a gun composed of superimposed rings in compression around a central tube. The design was separated into several distinct parts, allowing for easy transport and repair. Lord Palmerston was impressed with the design and ordered two of the guns in 1855 at a cost of nearly £5,000 each. The guns were ready by 1857 and four test firings were carried out on Woolwich marshes. A successful firing was achieved and a one-ton projectile was sent over one and a half miles. An observer described the slow and majestic motion of these great globes through the air. Despite this however, most of the tests had to be abandoned due to fractures forming in the rings and an eventual break of one of the longitudinal tie bars. Because of this, the War Ministry refused to spend any more money on the project and it was abandoned. One of the mortars would eventually make its way to Fort Nelson in 1993 and was placed on its concrete display in 1995. Despite the project's failure, Mallet's conception of using built-up layers under tension for more equal stress distribution would birth the concept of the built-up gun, which would inspire William Armstrong to produce his range of guns adopted for service in 1858. By the time of the mid-1880s, France was no longer considered a threat, and with advances in artillery, Fort Nelson's original defensive function was now completely defunct. Because of this, its armament was entirely removed in 1903. Britain's main rival in Europe was now Germany. Unified in 1871, the German state was quickly becoming the most powerful and modern military power on the continent, and Britain had entered a new arms race. The late 19th century saw the rapid evolution and advancement of artillery systems. Most notable was the development of the recoil mechanism, which allowed a gun's barrel to slide back within its own carriage. Hydraulics controlled this mechanism and it allowed the gun to remain trained on a target without being thrown out of position after every firing. Combined with rifled barrels, breech loading and improved range finding and sighting devices, artillery was becoming terrifyingly powerful and accurate. 
A good example of these new developments is this wrought iron 7 inch Armstrong gun from 1862. Although outdated by the time Fort Nelson was constructed, this was one of the first guns of a modern type made. With its breech loading mechanism and rifled barrel, it could fire a 110 pound shell with good accuracy for the time. At the turn of the century, further improvements such as brass cartridge cases and smokeless nitrocellulose powder contributed to the production of vast arsenals of so-called quick-firing guns. This new technology was setting the stage for the most devastating war the world had ever seen. With tensions rising in Europe, in 1911 Fort Nelson became a training base for a battery of the newly formed Royal Garrison Artillery. Soldiers practiced drills with new artillery pieces like the Ordnance BL-60 Pounder, a British 5-inch breech-loading gun which would be used extensively during the First World War. When war broke out in 1914, Germany sought the rapid defeat of France in order to avoid a prolonged war on two fronts with Russia. To achieve this, Germany planned to invade France through Belgium, a nation whose neutrality had long been guaranteed by Britain. To do this, German forces had to destroy forts defending Belgium's borders. They deployed huge siege guns like the Krupp 42cm, nicknamed Big Bertha, which made short work of the defences. The beginning stages of World War I involved modern fast-moving field operations, with the Germans deploying a 7.7cm quick-firing gun which came up against its French equivalent, the Sassuant Cannes. These guns caused massive casualties on both sides, and prevented outflanking manoeuvres, causing the fighting to eventually devolve into a stalemate, resulting in a static state of trench warfare, with the Western Front extending all the way from the French coast to the mountains of Switzerland. The British had their own 18-pounder quick-firing field gun which was deployed to the front in large numbers, forming the bulk of the Royal Field Artillery's arsenal. Guns of this type are thought to have fired nearly 100 million shells over the course of the war. Most artillery of this period fell into two categories, field guns which fired rounds at low angles and howitzers which fired at high angles. The Germans were eventually able to combine these roles with the 10.5cm quick-firing light-filled howitzer 16 eventually replaced by this version 18. After the outbreak of war, Fort Nelson became a training base for soldiers waiting to be sent to the Western Front. In order to accommodate the influx of soldiers, various buildings were converted into makeshift barracks, including the empty capineers and mortar batteries. The hasty accommodation was reportedly very cold and uncomfortable. Private George Weston described it as like being in an opening hole. The cliffs rise up above the grim old fort, shutting out all the sunshine, but not the wind by any means. The First World War was the first truly mechanised war. It saw the rapid development of modern artillery and also the introduction of new technologies to the battlefield, including tanks and aircraft. The First World War was the first major conflict to introduce the use of aircraft as a vital military asset. The British government recognised this as early as 1924, and plans for extensive anti-aircraft batteries to defend the nation were devised. These plans wouldn't be put into effect however, until tensions with Germany began to peak, and by the late 1930s, work on these AA defences had begun. Owing to their importance as major naval bases, close to 60 AA batteries were erected along the coastline around Portsmouth and Southampton. These batteries were mostly equipped with 3.7 inch ACAC guns and Swedish Bofors 40mm automatic guns for close air defence. Bofors guns were used extensively by many nations throughout the war. Its high rate of fire made it an excellent light anti-aircraft gun, and was used to defend field armies and fitted upon many ships. A testament to its effectiveness and reliability is the fact it was still being used by Argentinian and British forces during the Falklands War, and a modern version was even fitted to Lockheed AC-130 gunship. The 3.7-inch AA gun, or 3.7, made by Vickers, was Britain's main defence against German bombers. The 3.7 was also used against tanks and other ground targets. Mobile and stationary batteries of 3.7s helped to defend Portsmouth and were supplied with ammunition from Fort Nelson. The German equivalent was of course the famous 88. A very effective AA gun, this weapon could also be used against ground targets and formed the main armament of the Tiger I tank. German propaganda helped to hype the 88 as a wonder weapon, although the British 3.7 fired a larger round at a higher rate and to greater heights. 
The 37 remained in service until 1959, when guided missile systems began to replace AA guns. A more powerful defence than the 37 was the 4.5 inch gun. Adapted from the naval gun that served on various warships, the 4.5 inch gun was used to defend British naval bases and coastlines. Its larger shell gave it greater destructive power against enemy aircraft than the 37, but by 1944 improvements made to aircraft meant that it would be superseded by the even more powerful 5.25 inch gun, and was eventually declared obsolete in 1951. All of the new AA batteries defending Portsmouth would need large supplies of ammunition, and in 1938, work began to convert Fort Nelson into a massive ammunition store. Ten new brick and concrete magazines were built on the parade ground, two of which remain today. Combining these new magazines with the fort's underground one, Fort Nelson was now capable of storing 42,000 rounds of 3.7 and 5.25 inch ammunition and thousands more 14mm rounds. To assist with the movement of this ammunition, a conveyor belt was installed in the main tunnel leading to the underground magazine. A narrow gauge railway was also placed on the street outside. The ammunition was handled by the Royal Army Ordnance Corps, as well as the occupying infantry. It was very dangerous work to handle such large volumes of explosives, especially on the night of 9th to 10th of January 1941, when the fort was subject to a heavy raid. German bombers swarmed overhead, but the men who manned the fort carried out their duties regardless, despite the fact that a single hit to the magazine could have destroyed the entire fort. This earned the men a commendation for their quote, unstinting efforts in supplying a further 1,220 rounds of ammunition by night to the various gun positions. There were other changes made to the fort during this time. The parade perimeter was concreted, and foliage was allowed to grow over the ramparts to help camouflage the fort from enemy aircraft. Lower openings in the outer wall from which cannons had once jutted were bricked up to prevent saboteurs from sneaking in. Part of the western parade wall was demolished, and a new western gate was installed to allow the easy passage of lorries, which would enter here and exit on the other side of the fort, following a one-way system. Note the visible chalk blocks, one of the original building materials used during construction of the fort. Numerous pieces of graffiti drawn by soldiers have been found throughout the fort from this period, including this image of a soldier with a Bren gun shooting Hitler in the head. After the war, the fort was used as a storage site for military equipment, but began to fall into disrepair. By the 1970s, the fort was almost completely derelict and overgrown with vegetation. Despite this, it was declared a Grade 1 listed building and site of historical significance in 1971. In 1979, the fort was bought off the MOD by Hampshire County Council, and restoration efforts began. It was first opened to the public in 1984, and in 1988 the Royal Armouries leased the fort from the council to help with restoration. The fort has expanded as a museum and carries out regular impressive demonstrations of various artillery pieces. A vast collection of guns is displayed throughout the fort by the Royal Armouries. That's about all I had to say on the history of Fort Nelson, and the rest of this video will be devoted to looking at some of the more interesting pieces from the Royal Armoury's artillery collection. So if you want to see some cool guns, then uh, stick around. Fort Nelson holds thousands of artillery pieces, but the first two guns any visitor sees are Mallet's Mortar, which I've already talked about, and this 14-inch Mark VII naval gun. Guns of this type were built between 1937 and 46 for battleships of the King George V class. Ships of this class included HMS King George V and Prince of Wales, which helped to sink Bismarck, and HMS Duke of York, which helped to sink the Scharnhorst. The shells weighed 0.65 tonnes and could be sent almost 22 miles, or up to 28 when supercharged. This gun never saw action, however, as it was one of the last of its kind ever made and would never even go to sea, as the battleships it served upon were declared obsolete by the Navy after World War II. Some of the other big guns include this 18-inch howitzer, built by the British in an attempt to break the stalemate of the First World War's trench warfare. It was so large it could only be transported via rail. Only four of these guns were completed before the armistice was signed in 1918. One 18-inch howitzer was stationed in Kent during the Second World War to defend against potential invasion, 
and during test firings, local villagers were told to open doors and windows to avoid damage from shockwaves. However, an eyewitness reported that, I remember there was an elderly couple standing by their cottage, near where we were shooting, and every time we fired, their roof lost another tile. Technically, the largest gun on display is the Iraqi supergun, although really this is just a small section of the barrel. Altogether, the gun would have been over 150 metres long. The story of this weapon is quite fascinating, and really deserves its own video. The gun was originally designed by the Canadian physicist and international arms trader Dr Gerald Ball for Saddam Hussein as part of a secret Iraqi project known as Project Babylon, which planned to create an artillery piece with a range of 600 miles. Various companies in Europe were commissioned to build separate pieces of the gun, and this part was made in Britain by Sheffield Forge Masters, and was destined for Iraq under the guise of being part of an oil pipeline. However, it was seized at customs before it could leave the country. From big to old, there are some more ancient pieces of artillery to be found, like this 15th century Turkish Great Bombard, which fired huge stone balls. It was ordered by Sultan Mehmet II from bronze founder Munir Ali, and was a revolutionary piece of medieval technology. The gun is cast from two pieces, the powder chamber and barrel which screw together. Remarkably, the gun was kept in firing condition until the 19th century, when in 1866 Sultan Abdul Aziz presented it to Queen Victoria. Perhaps the most beautiful gun on display is this intricately wrought Italian piece dated 1773. Most probably commissioned by the commander of the artillery of the Order of St John of Malta for its Grand Master, its barrel was based on one cast in 1864 by Razio Antonio Alberghetti, bronze founder to the Republic of Venice. It is signed Philippe Laterellis of Rome, who is perhaps responsible for the lavish decoration. Equally stylish is this bronze gun, in the form of a dragon, taken from the Burmese by the British after their victory in 1885. And finally, one of the stranger guns on display is the British Smith gun, a makeshift anti-tank gun created for the Home Guard. It was wheeled about on two wheels and was tipped over on its side in order to be fired. Britain had a shortage of anti-tank weapons after Dunkirk, which encouraged a retired army major named William H. Smith to create the Smith gun. The gun did not impress the Ordnance Board, but Churchill liked the gun, and so six or seven of them came to be issued to the Home Guard. It had a 3-inch smooth bore barrel, and could penetrate 80 millimetres of armour at 45 metres. Well, that's about all I had to say. I could go on for hours if I wanted to talk about more of the guns. Uh, but this video is already pretty long, so I'm going to leave it there. Uh, big thanks for anyone watching, if you're still watching. I'll see you in the next one. Look at all those guns.